Did, did he say feared? <laughs> okay. Well, I am going to be a little bit scary tonight. All right. Carl's asked me to come and talk to you a little bit about, about the cyber domain and cybersecurity and the, and the challenges that, pre that presents any industry, but particularly an industry like this one, which, which you know, can tend to be a bit fragile in, in, in certain areas. Uh, this is a topic bigger than all outdoors. I'm going to make no attempt to be comprehensive. I, I hope to throw thoughts out there that, that become perhaps part of a continuing conversation for folks. Um, I also don't claim I'm coming down from Sinai with tablets. Uh, there's an awful lot of dispute about a lot of things going on in the cyber domain. So I guess at bottom, this is gonna be 30 or 35 minutes of suggestions about how to think about the problem. And then we'll go from there, all right? And if I, if I do this well and efficiently, I will leave some time for questions. So, so I mean, the first, first slide comes up there and says, why is this still so hard? I actually did something like this to a much larger group. It was over 3,500 people several years ago in the summer out in Vegas at Caesars Palace. I was, I was talking to uh, an organization called Black Hat, okay, um, 3,000, 3,500 claiming to be reformed hackers who get together once a year. And I'm a former director of the National Security Agency. You get a little torque in the presentation there. I, um, I actually said, I actually began the conversation with, uh, you know, I'm not a technologist like you folks, but I think this cyber thing's catching on. <laughs> and they, actually, they just gave me polite laughter, all right? Um, but the point I made to them was this. Uh, we, even they, don't appreciate how big a deal this is, how disruptive a development this is in human behavior. So I, I played my own Eddie McMahon to my own Johnny Carson out there in Vegas and said, how big a deal is it, Johnny? And the answer I came up with, since I told you I'm not a technologist, I'm actually a history major, was this is as disruptive to, to all aspects of human life as, as was the European discovery of the Western Hemisphere. Remember back 500 years ago, the age of sail? That changed everything. Right? It actually discovered what we perhaps with a touch of arrogance, called the New World. Well, we Americans think that this is a new world, too. Here's Richard Danzig's dis description of, of, of why this is a problem. Danzig, former Secretary of the Navy, has done some thinking about this, says this pretty eloquently. I like the back half, where he actually gets the words nourish and poison, not just into the same thought, but into the same substance. The very thing that nourishes also poisons. And this is so big a deal for us that we Americans, your, your armed forces, actually think of this as a domain. Remember I made a comparison to the age of sail 500 years ago, the discovery of a new world? I went down to San Antonio in early 1996. I was a, a brigadier going on to Two Star, and I took command of something called the Air Intelligence Agency. And America's Air Force has actually been kind of forward-leaning on thinking about cyber. And, and my, my new staff didn't quite say this to me, but if I had to boil down everything they told me that first couple of weeks, it was general. Sit down, take out a clean sheet of paper and a number two pencil, and write this down. <laughs> Land, sea, air, space, cyber. It is a domain. It's, 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 it's not bandwidth. It's not a network. It's not a budget line item. It's, it's a new location, just like the European discovery of the Western Hemisphere, a new location in which we are now going to go do stuff, okay. a new domain. Now, now I, I fully recognize that, and by the way, I did this with the guys out of Black Hat too. I said, I get it. This domain is different than those four. I know who made these four, and I think he did a good job. I'm pretty sure I know who did this one, and you screwed it up. <laughs> you all know who made the internet, right? I love this. Thank you. <laughs> I get that. Every... No, it wasn't Al Gore. <laughs> it, it was my neighbor. 
and it was my neighbor. That's Vince Cerf in the uh, lower right-hand corner of that slide. Vin is still actively involved. That, that's also Vin, by the way, second from the right in that photo out at Stanford uh, a long, long, long time ago. Vin is, is considered one of the fathers of the internet. He still works for Google. His business card, his job description is internet evangelist, is, is what it says. Um, we made this, and Vince was part of the team that put it together. He, he comes to my classes at George Mason uh, University. It's really kind of neat. It's, it's kind of like I'm teaching Western Civ, and I get to say, ladies and gentlemen, a real treat tonight, Christopher Columbus. <laughs> okay. Because here's a guy who actually did it. And I said, Vin, it's really not very secure, is it? And his answer to me was quite candid. He said, Mike, it wasn't in the statement of work. I mean, when they, they got the tasking from the Department of Defense, ARPA, the Advanced Research Projects Agency, it was, hey, guys, build me something that allows me to quickly and easily move large volumes of data between a limited number of nodes, all of whom I know and all of whom I trust. Look at top right. right? It's connecting a few universities and the federal labs. Build me something, Vint that allows me to move large volumes of data quickly and easily between a limited number of nodes, all of whom I know and all of whom I trust. Okay. The sad part is, as Vin tells my class, we really didn't know it was going to take off the way it did. <laughs> and that statement I gave you remained the architectural principle of this. This is built on inherent trust just the way that was except this is comprised of almost a limitless number of nodes, most of whom you don't know, and a whole bunch of whom you should never trust. And so it was designed for ease of use. It was designed for movement. It, it, it was designed to be empowering. Security was an afterthought. I mean, if you go back, if you go back to that, let me go back to these, you know, just wiring up the labs and so on, that's all family and friends. Building security into that would be like putting a cipher locked door between your kitchen and your dining room. Why in God's name would you do that? The whole design of the house is to enable you to get the food while it's hot from one room to the other. It flies in the face of what you were doing. But unfortunately, what we were doing then grew into that. So what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> Here's, um, here's my taxonomy of, of cyber sins. And this is really important. I'm going to get a little tutorial on you here, a little, a little professorial. We Americans are very sloppy in our language when it comes to describing unpleasant events on the World Wide Web. We call anything that goes on out there an attack. And i got to tell you, when we do it, and we do a lot of this, and I'll get to that in a minute, when we do it, we don't call everything an attack. We really need to have a more precision in our language in order to conceptualize what it is we're going to do to fix that. So precision in our language, what could possibly go wrong? By and large, the most of the stuff that goes wrong out there in the World Wide Web is sin number one here. It's just somebody stealing your stuff. Right? Remember, you've decided to go into this new domain, land, sea, or say cyber, and we've decided because, oh, God, it is so empowering to take stuff we used to keep in a safe or a desk drawer, or in our wallet, or in our pocket, and put it in our cell phone, which inhabits this new domain, which I've already told you is very, very difficult to defend. So theft of data, uh, your PIN number, your social security number, your credit card number, your intellectual property, your negotiating position, your state secrets, stealing your stuff. There's also corrupting your stuff. And by the way, the longer we go, by the way, if we were doing this three years ago, I kind of would have said, and there's other stuff, but fundamentally it's stealing your stuff. Uh, we're sliding down this scale. With more and more frequency, we're seeing, we're seeing those other things, number two, three, and four, happen more often. There is corrupting your stuff. I'm going to show you a slide in a, in a few minutes that shows the results of an Iranian attack against the Sands Casino system. Now, why in God's name would the Iranians attack the Sands Casino system? The owner was a strong supporter of Israel, may have said a few nasty things about the Ayatollah, okay? And, and the, the Iranians went into that network and cleaned the data, didn't steal the data, erased the data, corrupted the data. 
Now, that is probably catastrophic if that were to happen to American financial services. I would tuck gaming right up near financial services when it comes to how bad a story it is when your data gets corrupted. So there's corrupting your stuff, there's hurting your network. Uh, I'll show you a slide in a few slides about Sony North America, attacked by North Korea, okay, in which their network was destroyed by a cyber attack. And then uh, the fourth sin category of sin up I've listed up there, is using a weapon up here in the cyber domain to create effects down here in physical space. And here the, the poster child for this is something called Stuxnet, which was a, cyber, a weapon comprised of ones and zeros that convinced the thousand centrifuges at Natanz, the Iranian nuclear facility, to spin at self-destructive speeds while the computers that were overwatching the centrifuge hull were essentially telling the operators, there's nothing interesting to see here, boys, move along. And the operators didn't know that the centrifuges were destroying themselves until they started hearing the pops and bangs from the centrifuge hull. Now, Carl said I'm a former director of CIA. I view that event as an almost unalloyed good, okay, destroying a thousand centrifuges in Iran. But even I recognize how big a deal that was. Let me say what I just told you in slightly different words. Someone, almost certainly a nation state, because that was just too hard to do from the garage. Someone, almost certainly a nation state, maybe two nation states, I don't know. Someone, almost certainly a nation state, just used a weapon comprised of ones and zeros during a time of peace to destroy what another nation could only describe as their critical infrastructure. Ouch. If those are the cyber sins, who are the cyber sinners? Um, you can slice and dice this every which way, three broad categories, nation states, criminal gangs, and I really don't have a good phrase for that last group, hacktivist, activist, lulsec, anonymous, 20-somethings that haven't talked to the opposite gender in years, <laughs> living in their mom's... I by the way, this is, this is off the record. If that shows publicly, I'm going to have a hell of a time logging on. So <laughs> there's movement inside each one of these categories. I, by the way, I've put the cyber, cyber powerful nations up there, the cyber active nations, and let me play, play with some cards face up. We are really good at this. I wasn't just the head of CIA. I was also the head of NSA, all right? We steal other people's stuff better than anyone else on the planet. I'd like to think the BCS consistently ranks us number one. But we steal stuff to keep you free and to keep you safe. We do not steal stuff to make you rich. And that actually makes us unique. I can think of four other countries who can say those last two sentences and still have them be true. They're the usual suspects, they all speak English. One way or another, they all showed up at Bletchley Park back in World War II. It's, it's the Anglo-Saxon democracies. Everyone else practically steals for commercial advantage. States, all other states, steal for commercial advantage. So although we're very good at this and very powerful, we self-restrain. A lot of other countries don't self-restrain. Now look, there's an awful lot of talk out there. Leon Panetta, before he left the, uh, as Secretary of Defense, Leon gave a speech on the intrepid in in uh, the Hudson River, in which he said, the next Pearl Harbor is gonna be a cyber Pearl Harbor. The next 9-11 is gonna be a digital 9-11. I'm not quite there, all right? Um, let me give you a thought. If the Chinese are turning out all the lights on the eastern seaboard, that is not the first thing the president's gonna to be told in his daily brief tomorrow morning. If the Chinese are turning out all the lights on the eastern seaboard, there's other stuff going on. That's a subset. So I, you know, this is probably the only ray of sunshine in my whole 40 minutes up here, all right? I don't quite fear that catastrophic attack that this just wipes out a significant fraction of American infrastructure. I am more concerned about some of these other actors up there. See the flags? Okay, I've got Iran, I've got North Korea, I've got Russia. I'm more afraid about that isolated, renegade, sanctioned, nothing to lose, uh, what the hell, let's just roll the dice nation state. 
which is kind of a permanent definition in North Korea, okay, but could also be a definition of Iran if that nuclear thing goes south. I can even picture it being, um, in my darker moments, the Russians, as sanctions begin to squeeze and the autocrats caught trying to keep his kleptocrats happy and he's got hard choices to make and he may want, in any event, I can see countries who might want to reach out and poke us to demonstrate that, you know, this economic warfare thing isn't cost free. Two can play the game. So nation states can come after infrastructure. Criminal gangs, these are guns for hire. Most of them in the post-Soviet space. All right, a lot of them Russians, Ukrainian, Moldovans, Belarusians, and so on. All right, um, they'll, they'll go out to the highest bidder. And then finally, hacktivists and activists, um, by and large, self-motivated. Uh, remember the WikiLeaks thing, Join Assange, several years ago? Yeah, it, it turns out that you could contribute to WikiLeaks through PayPal. Uh, the US government kind of went, <clears throat> excuse me, <laughs> we don't think that's a great idea. PayPal took the account down these guys self-organized and conducted a distributed denial of service attack against, uh, against PayPal. They're kind of racked and stacked there based upon competencies. Nation states most competent, gangs next, hacktivists, third group. Okay. Um, any one of them can come after your industry. I've kind of described some scenarios where nation states could. Criminal gangs, like I said, guns for hire. Hacktivists, most of the people in this room represent iconic institutions. Iconic institutions that occasionally are criticized by other people in the world. And so, you know, it's not a great stretch of the imagination to see group three here coming at the industries represented in this room, not because of anything you've done, but just because of who you are. So, we've seen a lot of this. Uh, these are mostly theft of data, okay? And you've probably read about them, seen about them in the, uh, in the open press, okay? Federal government's not been immune to this. By the way, I, I actually offered some public, public commentary. This is the OPM thing. This is taking really personal data from about 24 million people, including me and probably a whole bunch of other people in the room and all those things in your security background investigation, they were lifted by the Chinese. Our government isn't quite saying it's the Chinese. I'm telling you, it's the Chinese, okay? Um, I don't blame China for this one, all right? This is not shame on China. This is shame on us. If I were still director of NSA and I had the ability to grab that kind of data from the People's Republic of China, I'd have done it in a heartbeat. And, and here's the punchline, I would not have had to go downtown in DC to ask anyone's permission. The fact that we lost this data is our fault, not China's. That was a legitimate foreign intelligence target. I mentioned the attack on Sony Pictures. This one was particularly nasty. We've actually, at the Chertoff Group, have had a chance to talk to the folks at Sony. All those sins I gave you, you know, stealing your stuff, affecting your network, corrupting your data, creating physical destruction, they were all present. They stole copyrighted data, actually pushed movies out before, before you know, they, Sony decided to release them. They destroyed material in Sony files. They made the Sony network inoperable, and they got damn close to physical harm. Um, I grew up in Pittsburgh. One of the most frightening things I ever heard growing up on the north side was, Hayden, I know where you live, and I know what kind of car you drive. The people at Sony were getting those kinds of notes from the attackers, up to and including, and I know what high school your daughter goes to. But a very, very vicious attack. Um, step back from it, let me describe it for you in kind of doctrinal terms. A nation state has attacked a North American-based company in order to coerce its behavior. Ouch. Big deal. That's the Sands Casino attack. I mentioned that to you earlier. Ah, yeah, two days before Christmas. It looks as if, there, there's still some clouds around this one, but it looks as if the Russians, um, remember the nation states, criminal gangs, crazy people? The Russians use criminal gangs 
to do most of their cyber dirty work so that they can have a cutout. Um, I, uh, I gave a version of this presentation at the Reagan Center in DC. Uh, I was doing it for Kaspersky, North America. Yevgeny Kaspersky, uh, Russian coder, uh, actually a very good cybersecurity company. A lot of Americans are a little nervous about Yevgeny because he had, he had ties to the FSB, all right, the uh, Russian security service. Carl introduced me as being director of CIA and NSA. That's, in my mind, that's not disqualifying, all right, that you're tied to your nation's, you have relationships with your nation's security service. Anyway, I gave the speech for Yevgeny. I come off stage and um, I had said that Estonia had been, been attacked by patriotic Russian hackers, okay? And I, I came uh, off stage and Yevgeny says to me, Michael, great, great, great presentation, but you realize that attack on Estonia in 2007, uh, those weren't patriotic Russian hackers. Okay, who were they? He said, those, those were the criminal gangs. And then Yevgeny began to explain to me the, the relationship. Now, these are my words now, not Yevgeny's. Remember the scene from Godfather 1? The first scene, Don Corleone is in the library. You got the wedding going on for the daughter. Don Corleone's in the library, and the undertaker's there asking for a favor. His daughter's under some sense, some sense of risk, and he asks Don Corleone for protection. And Don Corleone says, yes, I will grant you this favor, but I may come to you from time to time for a service. That is the relationship of the Russian Federation to Russian cyber criminal gangs. Don Vladimir allows the gangs to shoot out and do what they will without interference from the Russian state. But from time to time, Don Vladimir will come to them and say, now I have need of a service. That is very likely what happened here. Um, and I, you know, I'm preparing this briefing to come here and this comes across my desk. All right, the, the quotes up there I have lifted from Israeli press coverage. So it remains to be seen exactly what happened, but it happened just recently. By the way, Israel's really good at this. Okay? It, it is considered the cyber startup nation. They take young kids out of their SIG and service, they come off after their six years duty, and they start their own businesses and they're really good. So if, if these kinds of things can happen in Israel, they can happen here. As the dust settles, it appears as if it was not an attack on the Israeli grid, but it was an attack on, on the administrative networks of the arm of the Israeli government that oversees Israeli power. And I guess I put this slide in here to simply suggest this is gonna get better fast this is a heat map of things connected to the World Wide Web. Okay, you can see, just by the glow there, where the concentration is. And as we begin to wire the internet of everything, as we go to smart grid, thereby allowing those Russian criminal gangs to talk to my toaster, okay, because everything has been connected, the kinds of dangers we see here are gonna grow. At which point you should say, okay, I get it, Hayden, it's bad. So let's go do something about it. What's my government doing? And not a whole lot. And this is a guy who had 39 years in government. This is a guy who was head of the National Security Agency. This is an incredibly difficult problem for government. Number one, the speed of technology and the speed of government are different. And so even in the best of worlds, it will be very hard for government to keep pace with the changing nature of threat. And our government has a peculiar problem. Our government actually respects civil liberties. Our political culture actually puts a great deal of value in protecting American privacy. Janine and I, my, my wife, we flew here from uh, Northern Virginia. We live, we live in McLean. So imagine we go back after a great weekend here and I can't sleep and I get up one night and I go to my front window upstairs and I look out and, and I see a Fairfax County police car going by putting a spotlight on the shrubs. I would think, and I think most people in this room would think, good, my tax dollars at work. Now, do a little mind experiment with me, please. 
Imagine whatever it is you think is the digital equivalent of that with the local government monitoring your network and tell me you're happy. Put another way, we Americans have not yet decided what it is we want or what it is we will allow our government to do to keep us safe up here in this domain. Trust me, former director of CIA, we get prickly down here as to what government should or shouldn't do to keep you safe. We have no structures up here yet. And because it is hard to do, because technology moves fast, because we have this strong political culture about privacy, our government will be permanently late to need in defending us in the cyber domain. Now, we've made some progress. The senator, I think, is very proud by getting this cybersecurity legislation passed. It's been lingering for a couple of Congresses. We finally got the legislation passed. It is good news, but it is a small, it's, it's about sharing threat information and, and, and lifting liability, vulnerability to industry when they share information with the government. It's good, but it's a small step, and it was years in coming. Here's the um, Department of Defense cyber strategy. Again, some modest progress. This is a speech given by Ash Carter out at Stanford. Um, early June, right? Yeah. Um, Secretary Carter listed three kind of categories of cyber attacks. Number one, he said, uh, routine attacks, you're on your own. We're not helping. More complex attacks, you can rely on the Department of Homeland Security to give you some assistance. Let me translate that for you. You're on your own. Then Secretary Carter went on to say that there are some attacks, however, that are so serious that we Americans will actually conduct what we would call down here in physical space, counter battery fire. We'd actually shoot back to disarm. Amy Ziegart was the interviewer out there, and Amy asked Secretary Carter, kind of the, the Ed McMahon to the Johnny Carson thing again, how bad an attack does it have to be, Ash? And that's Secretary Carter's definition. Significant loss of life, destruction of property, or lasting economic damage. Now, someone in Secretary Carter's entourage was asked, how often does that happen? And the answer he gave was, oh, maybe about 2% of the time. That is a ridiculously high number. It is a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of 2%. That said, I was both surprised and heartened that we actually said this. And look, I've been out of government seven years. For five of those years, I actually worried about whether or not I would be indicted if I actually said we could shoot back. And now you've got a Secretary of Defense not only saying we could, but explaining to you when we will. So the government's working on this, but it doesn't change my basic premise. You are far more responsible for your security up here in this domain then you have been required to be responsible for your security down here in these domains since about the closing of the American frontier in 1890. So, when the government is late to need in our society, the private sector steps in. And I guess one of the major messages I wanna give you tonight is that the private sector really has stepped in here. Um, this is a traditional risk equation. Risk is equal to the threat times your vulnerability to the threat times consequence. We see remarkable entrepreneurial and technological energy in the private sector in every one of those factors. Put another way, again, if we have to rely on ourselves more up here than we have down here that the government will be late to need, thank God the private sector in America is so active trying to respond to the real needs we have up there. Very briefly, all right, and I'll be, I'll be very efficient about this, most of the history of cybersecurity has been in V, the vulnerability factor, see it there? By the way, you all figured out this is a multiplication, right? So if I, I get any of those things to zero, we win. Most of the history of cybersecurity has been in V, vulnerability reduction. Think of your own language, firewalls, cyber hygiene, good passwords, turning the machines off for the weekend, right? It's about reducing attack surfaces. 
It's about don't let them get in. Okay? That's good. And we should do vulnerability reduction forever. But people who really know this know that vulnerability reduction, if done perfectly, and nobody does it perfectly, but if done perfectly, it'll keep about 80% of the attackers out. You, you realize what I just said, right? 20% who want in are getting in. And so although you keep doing V because you want to you slap the script kitties off the table so they don't distract you, all right? New, now, current technological entrepreneurial energy is in C. It's consequence, or frankly, consequence management. It is presumption, and here's the punchline for your industry. It is presumption of breach. They're getting in. Get over it. Operate while penetrated. Survive while under attack. The people who really know this tell me that the difference between an A and an F player doing this equation is not penetration. The difference between A and F is the time between flash and bang. The difference between A and F is the time between penetration and discovery of penetration, which on average is measured in months right now. And that's, that's the deal. So private sector, vulnerability reduction, private sector, consequence management, private sector, threat. Now look, in the traditional risk equation, the threat means you punch the guy in the nose so he's deterred from punching you. Hard to do in the cyber domain. So what the private sector is doing in the threat vector, the threat factor in the cyber domain is cyber threat intelligence. There are private companies out there who are doing not intelligence-like or intelligence-light activity, it's intelligence. Priority intelligence requirements, information needs, collection plans, collection, processing, analysis, dissemination, and very, very aggressively. There are American private companies who do web crawling, port scanning, have foreign national employees assuming personae in those Moldovan and Ukrainian chat rooms in order to give you fair warning. Now imagine yourself, the best company I can think of is Airbus, because it's just big and it's multinational. It's purely illustrative, okay? This is, I haven't done this with Airbus. But imagine if you're Airbus paying for cyber threat intelligence, and the cyber threat intelligence guys can come to you and say, they don't care about your wide bodies. They're after your helicopter designs. And that they, in this case, are these people here, and these people have been associated with these cyber attack tools. That's pretty good stuff. If you have that kind of information, you're not trying to defend yourself against all theoretical threats by theoretical, theoretical actors for theoretical purposes. You know what they're coming after. Um, I just wanted to add one last point. We want to defend the cyber domain, but we don't want to destroy it in the very act of defending it. Um, I skipped over that one. That's a grand debate back in Washington right now. All right. You have Jim Coney, the director of the FBI, uh, wanting backdoors and encryption so he can go after bad guys. If I were Jim Comey, I would have his position. I'm not Jim Comey. I think he's wrong. I think America is more secure with unbreakable end-to-end -end encryption with no backdoors. Back to this, Walter Russell Mead. I'll read that. Good. Okay. This is Freedom House's ranking of cyber freedom around the world. Remember why Vint built this in the first place, right? This is quintessentially American. Ubiquitous, egalitarian, technologically sophisticated, democratic, accessible, unitary, it's us. There are a bunch of people in the world who define cybersecurity different than you and I do. Check that one. Their definition of cybersecurity and the other countries similarly shaded is actually in opposition for the actual character and purpose of the World Wide Web. And so I just offer you the thought in closing that um, in 
preserving the web, in defending the web, be careful what we do because we don't want to legitimate other nations' efforts to actually destroy the web. You like my new Maslow thing? <laughs> okay, Carl, we got questions? Yep. From our audience, uh, America seems to, be, seems to be regressing as it relates to the matters that you've been discussing. Is there any chance that we will see a policy change and what, what will it take for that to occur? Yeah, I've actually been asked this by some candidates. And um, my comment is, all the vectors are right. I mean, I, I actually threw a couple in there. The, the, the executive order, the uh, Ash Carter speech, um, the, the legislation, all right? All the vectors are right. All, all we're missing here is velocity, all right? We, we just aren't doing it fast enough. So here's, here's my, and, and the problem, Carl, is back to our political culture. All right, this is made far more difficult for us than it is even for the French, or even for the British, all right? Our political culture is so sensitive about privacy, okay, that, that we, we, you know, you take one step in cyber, if, if, you, if you go this way, you got the Chamber of Commerce yelling at you, and if you go that way, you got the American Civil Liberties Union yelling at you. Okay. By the way, it's so bad that Senators Collins and Lieberman, what, one session, two sessions ago, had a cybersecurity bill that was opposed by both the Chamber of Commerce and the ACLU. Okay? That, that's how difficult this is. So, Carl, I think the answer is when a Republican is in the White House, he's got to walk across Lafayette Park to the Chamber of Commerce and, and do that little speech from uh, Marlon Brando's movie on the waterfront and simply say, it ain't your night, kid. And when a Democrat's in the White House, he's got to go to his base, the, the privacy world, and say, it ain't your night, kid. And by tacking that way, with, with, with presidents, in essence, tacking against their base rather than reinforcing their base, the boat moves even against this political cultural wind. That's what's necessary. Unfortunately, historically, we have, the occupants of the Oval have kind of trended in the direction of their base rather than against their base. It's going to require that political heroism to go against base, both parties. Another question, a little shift of gears. Would Bitcoin and other decentralized currencies make our financial system safer? I, I don't know. I really don't. Um, this is another example of going up here because it's just so tremendously empowering, right? I mean, it just allows us to do th things we, we'd never been able to do before. But with it, back to Richard Danzig, what nourishes poisons. And so I, I don't know enough to pass a judgment. I would just caution that going up there for anything, as empowering as it is, creates vulnerabilities that would not otherwise exist. I'm just a civilian, but um, a few weeks ago, a friend of our forum Admiral Gary Ruffhead, former Chief of Naval Operations, who I'm sure you're familiar with, yeah. told me, oh, I can't, I've just got back to China. I would have responded to your email, but I go to China completely naked. I don't bring my computer, I don't bring my cell phone, I don't communicate at all. He's also on the board of Grumman. So, but how do you function as a business person in that, in today's country? I don't, I don't go to China with any digital device ever, period. Right, and if you, you know, if you're kind of getting shaky there, okay, um, <laughs> buy one for the trip and drop it in the trash as you leave the airport. Seriously, I, I, would, I would never bring a digital device to the People's Republic of China or Hong Kong. Here's one more. Um, how do you believe nation states should deal with attacks from foreign criminal gangs and hacktivists, as you described. Yeah. At what point should we hold nation states responsible for the actions of criminal gangs and hacktivists? Thanks, thanks, Carl. It's a great question. And it, look, I told you this is bigger than all outdoors, and I'm just tossing things up against the wall for further discussion. We have, tr because of this is so new and so disruptive and, 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 and so different up here, we don't, we don't know how to describe things, Carl. All right, so remember the North Korean Sony thing? Right, all right, okay. President, that, that was such a big deal that President Obama actually held a news conference on it. Good. And that, that, was a, that was a great thing. And he goes out there, and you know what he called it? He called it cyber vandalism. Okay? I think this is more than a brick heavier than spray painting a subway car in the Bronx. Okay? Now, that said, 
I don't know what I would have told him to call it. And so do you get, do you get the problem? Okay. Since we haven't yet figured out how to characterize the acts, we don't know what of our traditional tools we should apply in response to these acts. You know, if you think the government should have a greater role in this, this might be a good way to wrap up. If you think the government should have a greater role in it, there are multiple models for the government coming to our assistance, okay? You could look upon this as a law enforcement question. And, okay, now, now you got the law. It's a legal matter. Bring court beyond a reasonable doubt investigation. You could have the government keep you safe up here, approaching it as a law enforcement problem. You could have the government keep you safe up here, treating it as a first responder problem. Okay? What's the difference? Cop comes to my door, he can't go in. Fireman comes to my door with smoke coming out of my roof, he damn well better go in. Okay? It's a different role. You could think of the government's role in this as law enforcement, first responder. You could think of the government's role in this as this is really armed conflict. I want to do this according to the laws of armed conflict. Or you could think of the government's role up here in this domain as like the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, which frankly doesn't affect your life at all until they want to. And then it's almost absolute with regard to quarantine and, and travel and so on. Do you see? Look, and there are probably 10 other fingers I could hold up here and, and give, you, give you examples. But we have not yet decided, is this a law enforcement problem? Is this a military problem? Is this a first? That's how disruptive this is. We are, we are just in the beginning of our exploration of this new, new domain that, that we've built for ourselves to operate in. And so we're just going to have to work our way through it. Uh, I will add, as a final thought, um, the, the way we generally work our way through this is to arrive at political consensus. The way we generally get to political consensus is to have adult discussions. The way we have adult discussions is that we have a common body of knowledge that we all look at and share. We do not have a common body of knowledge on this issue. Our government hideously overclassifies it, and industry hides the ball on, from the government and one another for liability and other concerns. So until we have greater information sharing, we will not set in motion this process that finally gets us to a national consensus after adult discussion. Did that leave everybody smiling? <laughs> thanks, so, thanks so much. Thank you.